interesting is uh, you know your interest in the subjects. Uh, you are you know obviously gra you gravitate towards the more vulnerable sections of society. In your films, you have generally focused on children and women, and then uh, toward transgenders. Um, what's like the big philosophy of that? Um, I think children tell stories um, in such a beautiful way, without any filters, um, without any prejudice. They just see it, say it as they see it. And I don't think that adults can tell those kind of stories. And uh, I, I uh, throughout my career, even from day one, when I was making um, films, I chose children because I felt that they could look at anything, including war, um, including uh, abuses, and um, they could connect with the global audience. Because one of the things about making documentary films in the kind of countries that I do is that why should anybody else care in another part of the world about what's happening in that particular country? And I've always felt that you can break that barrier by having children tell that story because everybody has children around the world. And when people watch that, they say, well, this could have been my child. And I think that is one incredible way of getting a global audience to watch work. And, and plus, I think, um, and, and women, of course, because uh, I am, if you haven't guessed by now, hard <laughs> feminist. Um, and the other running themes that I've seen in, in your work is, has to do with uh, religion and modernity and you know, somewhat uh, where they come together. Um, can you speak to that too? Yeah, because uh, whether it's the Philippines where I did a film about the Catholic Church or whether it's uh, you know Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or some of the other countries, I, I focus on religion and modernity because I believe that religion is so twisted in so many of these countries and used by people to benefit themselves that it's sometimes it's it's good to hold a mirror up so people can see uh, you know how evil some of these people really are. And I'll give you an example. When I was filming Pakistan's Taliban generation, I was um, in a madrasa um, and uh, I was talking to uh, the madrasa head about children getting recruited to become child suicide bombers, and he, for the most part, said this never happens. It's absolute. Even though kids I interviewed in his madrasa told me they were getting trained to become suicide bombers. But then... then this was in Karachi. This is in Karachi, yes. And uh, at, at the end of the interview, uh, I, I looked at him and he said, you know, all we teach over here is to be a good Muslim, to do your duties. And, uh, you know, I said, that's, that's great. And then my cameraman moves slightly back to take a, a wide shot of of the madrasa and he thinks that obviously we've stopped filming and he looks at me and he says literally and I'll never forget this because it was it, it just showed the duplicity in a, in a, in a second was uh, tak kurbani ke bakre honge, hum rahenge. and and I'll tell you that I mean had he thought that we were still filming he would have never said that but this is exactly the duplicity, and that turn only, it took a few seconds for that to happen, and it's in my film. But, but, but so, what I like to do is I like to hold a mirror up to society, and let society judge themselves, you know, what's happening, and, and, and what is, uh, see it as black and white, and not the gray that we so often think uh, religion is. Okay, uh, I'd like to move a bit away from this, uh, to, the, to your process of filming. Uh, you mentioned in our earlier conversation you don't script a lot while doing your films. How does that work? So um, usually I come up with an idea, um, I read something or I meet someone that inspires an idea and then I come up with a proposal. I do a lot of research and, and off I go to film. And uh, sometimes we film for weeks and months and, uh, and then we come back into the edit room and then I start formulating the story. So I don't always know what my film is going to turn out like actually. Uh, I only know towards the end, um, uh, you know, when, when I'm in the edit room, how it's going to turn out. But do you also go back and shoot some more while you are in? Absolutely, we do. Uh, so uh, we often, uh, my team often goes back to shoot uh, stuff as we realize that perhaps we'd like to know, know more about this or perhaps we'd like to film a different situation or we need more material. So yeah, so my films are actually, to be honest, made uh, in the edit room. 
Um, the other, I mean, that leads to another question, which is really about the selection of subjects. Um, again, how do you sort of determine that? Because again, you are going out with this camera and shooting with a very vague idea. But, um, so I, my topics are, are chosen by. I have a barometer of anger. Okay, I'm a, I'm a quite an angry person. And when something really gets me angry, I know that that is going to be an incredible film. Because uh, uh, and, and and I've I've always I've always done that. I've always carried that with me, and I've always felt that that is something that you know I'm very passionate about things that make me angry because I want people to rectify that. And uh, so yeah, so when I'm reading the newspaper, I'm like, right, this is this something needs to be done about this, and and I channel my anger through a camera <laughs> onto the people. What what was very interesting to me, and I don't know, it might be an ethical issue involved. A lot of your subjects, in, including the transgenders, I'm not sure, uh, and the children that you shot, um, they do not necessarily get to see this film. Actually, um, everyone gets to see the film. Okay. My my subjects all get to see the film, uh, and uh, the transgender film has not been released, oh, so I they have not seen the film yet. But they saw parts of the film as the film was being made. But uh, all my films, my subjects get to watch the films. I think it's really important. And, and more than that, I mean, some people ask me, what happens? So people tell you, you your story, their stories, you put them out for the world to see what actually happens after that. And I, few things have happened, depending on the film that I've made, that the people in the film have actually benefited enormously, apart from the fact that of education or whatever. But I remember in 2005, I did a film <coughs> in Karachi uh, about the Shia bombings of mosques. And uh, a young man uh, who stood up to one of the, ch uh, the suicide bombers, um, he tripped a suicide bomber. And because of that, the bomb didn't go off. In the, in the exact place it should have gone off to get the maximum amount of damage, but he got injured and in the process landed up in hospital and um, became a star witness uh, against the accomplices of uh, the other, um, uh, the, the accomplices of the other um, the people who were there. And essentially, it became necessary to get him out of Pakistan uh, because his life was in danger. And uh, now the young man lives in Canada. And it was because of the film and the testimony in the film that we were able to petition the Canadian government to get him out of Pakistan. That's fine. Right. With that, I mean, you know, that naturally brings to my, you know, next question, which is a larger, more general question. Uh, again, where do you see the role of a documentary filmmaker? You talked about stories earlier on, but say, you know, fiction writers also tell stories. Again, it might also be connected to this larger idea. Where do you, do you even draw that line between a documentary film, this is the truth, or this is, you know, that kind of, you know, the, the line between, I come from a writing background, so for, for us, you know, we are constantly trying to blur these boundaries between non-fiction, fiction, there is this literary fiction now. So, is it the same for you? How do you look at it? Do you really make that distinction? Is it important to you? It's extremely important to me, and um, because my films are made for television, um, for either the UK or the US or, or Canada, um, we have to follow some very, very strict guidelines. There is a minimum team of six lawyers that looks at each and every frame in a film to see if it complies with the legal laws of that particular country. Um, we have to make sure that if someone makes a statement, that we have at least three other people backing that statement up. Um, it's it's really tedious amount of work, and I learned that very early on because my first three four films were for the New York Times, and the New York Times is very strict guidelines about checking and rechecking. And ever since then, and Channel Four in the UK is the same. So really, we can't put anything out there that borders even borders fiction. Wow. Well, um Okay, finally, I mean, before we open up to questions, um, I'd like to ask, so, you know, where do you, because I I personally meet and know lots of young <coughs> filmmakers, aspiring filmmakers. Um, you got that gig at the New York Times. Uh, what do you recommend? They all write in the New York Times? Well, you know, one of the things that I'll say is that um, a lot of young people in this country are very impatient. Uh, they, they, they want that big break to happen immediately. Um, or they want, they, they feel like there are no avenues to explore. I think that you need to chart your own path 
And given the digital world that we live in and how cheap it is to make films now, everyone owns a camera. And there are a million stories in this country. Uh, you literally just have to go out and shoot something and, and then take that to somebody. I mean, I have an open door for so many young people. I, I just taught a class at Zabis, and uh, you know, a number of those young students over there uh, want me to mentor them for, for other films, and I am. And I, I, I forever have an open door if people want to come to me for advice or whatever, because I strongly believe that we need to cultivate a community of filmmakers. Uh, and we need to cultivate a community of people who can help each other. I would love for there to be wonderful editors in this country or cinematographers so that I don't bring people from abroad. I don't want to bring an American or a Brit to Pakistan. I would like the Pakistanis to tell their own stories. Oh, you know, so I, I strongly believe in that cultivation and I know that when I, when, I, when I moved back to Pakistan, a lot of people said, well, people guard what they know very closely in this country. They, you know, they feel like if they've taught other people that skill, somehow or the other that person is going to rob them of their job. And, uh, different way. I look at it that like if we have a community of people, then I can go to them and they can come to us and together we can make films. Because one person doesn't make films. I did not make those films by myself. I have a team of people, very talented team of people that works with me. And now I'm training a number of young uh, um, men and women who are working with me to become filmmakers. And I think that, and one day I hope that there will be, you know, a pool of people we can all choose from. Cheers. Uh, Let's ask if you open the thing to the and please uh, make sure you are asking questions. That is something I have to repeat over and over again. Uh, ask questions, make them as short as possible, um, and Shermin will be happy to reply. Uh, can we start uh, with this lady over here?